This year, the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine was awarded to three scientists, O'Keeffe, Moser and Moser, for the discovery of place cells and grid cells, a work that would not have been possible without spike sorting. What is spike sorting? An easy approach to the problem is perhaps to think of the peasant trading of Bruegel. Imagine that someone put some microphone in the room, records the conversations, but doesn't understand the language of the people. Most people are sitting and talking, more or less together, and few people are moving around, generating some background noise. You're given, or this person is given, the recordings, and has to reconstruct the individual discourses. It, the person has also to find out how many people are talking. That's essentially what spike sorting is about. To continue this analogy, think of a brain activity as the sum of a conversation of this reading room. The raw data we would get from the microphone when we record from the brain looks look like this. You can see that most of the time, nothing happens. We only see background noise. From time to time, a spike shows up. Our first task is to isolate the spikes. In order to do that automatically, we have to characterize our background noise. In order to characterize our background noise in the presence of spike, we rely on the median absolute deviation, a robust statistics. Once the spikes have been isolated, we want to group spikes together based on similar similarity of amplitude. That's where the analogy of a people talking can be useful. We could use in the discourse reconstruction algorithm the fact that some people speak very loudly while other people speak quickly. In the spike context, that will translate into some spikes having a large amplitude on all recording sites and other spikes having small amplitude on all recording sites, as illustrated here, with the large spikes in red and the tiny spikes in black. Another feature we could use is the fact that one person will be sitting close to a microphone and away from the others, and will therefore generate a much stronger signal on the close microphone and a weak signal on the over microphone. Another person will be sitting just at the opposite side of the room, generating a large signal on the far away microphone and a weak signal on the closed microphone with respect to the first person. Exactly the same for the neurons. We'll have spikes with a large amplitude on one electrode and a weaker amplitude on the other electrodes, and vice versa, as illustrated here with a black and red spike. Till now, we've been using the most obvious features in our automatic discourse reconstruction algorithm. But clearly, some regularities Less obvious, like an accent, could be very fruitfully used in order to separate people. That's where an automatic method like principal component analysis helps us to find interesting directions or features in a high dimensional space. Principal component analysis provides us with features that are directions in the high dimensional space in which the spikes are living at the beginning. We will select the most prominent features and project each individual spike on each of these interesting features. Then each spike becomes a point in a space that has as many dimensions as we have features. Typically, more than two features are used, meaning that the points representing the spikes are living in a space which has more than two dimensions. In order to help us in visualizing the data set, we use a software called GCOBI that, through the dynamics 
allows us to visualize data living in more than two dimensions. As you can see here, our complete data set is represented, and a striking feature or a striking property which appears immediately is that separate clouds or clusters are clearly visible. We will associate neurons to clouds. And our task becomes then to find out how many clouds we have, the center of each cloud, and for each spike or each point, the closest center. After observing our dataset spinning in this 3D space, we quickly figure out that 10 clouds are present and want to find out for each cloud the center, and for each point, the closest center, so the, cl the cloud of membership. That's where an automatic algorithm like the k-means will do the job for us in a few milliseconds. After running the k-means, we go back to the dynamical display, painting every point according to the, with a color corresponding to the cluster membership, and evaluating the trustworthiness of our classification. Here we see clearly that points with the same color remain together and are, are well separated from the points having another color. In the simple cases, which are not so rare, spike sorting is done at that stage. As a matter of fact, using amplitude information only, as we've been doing so far, won't work for some datasets. We illustrate the problem with a toy example of simulated data. We have here three neurons. The tiny neuron, drawn in red, generates events in the same region as the two other neurons. That means that if we use only amplitude information, for most of the spikes of a tiny neuron, we won't be able to tell from which neuron they originate. We need to use more information than just amplitude information. What property of the data have, have we been neglecting so far? The occurrence time of the spikes. We know that neurons generate spikes with a rather specific discharge statistics. And ideally, we would like to include this information or an estimation of this information in our sorting procedure. Including this time information requires the development of stochastic models of a neural discharge. These models, ideally, should be parsimonious accurate and lead to computationally efficient algorithms, a subject of active research, in, part in particular here at the Neuron Math Center. <music> 